James Cook is remembered as one of the greatest explorers in the Age of Enlightenment. He charted more parts of the world than anyone and made significant contributions to science. A fascinating aspect of history which is largely unknown is the way this can be traced through dance. The untold story about Cook concerns the music and dances which were interwoven through his life. He used dancing on his ships to keep his crew healthy and in good spirits, as well as in cultural exchanges with the people he encountered on his voyages. News of his adventures in the Pacific stimulated great interest in Britain and Europe and led to, to the creation of social dances and theatrical works to celebrate his achievements. I'm Dr Heather blastow clark a dance historian based in Brisbane. I study the history of colonial Australia, beginning with the earliest explorations by Europeans, including the voyages of Captain Cook. By examining dance in any particular era, we can learn about the philosophies, the happenings and the prevailing fashions of the time. James Cook lived when the English country dance was the leading form of social dance. It was enjoyed at all levels of society, everywhere from the royal court through to the lowliest hovel. Even in the notorious Newgate prison and on ships transporting convicts to Australia. Dancing was part of the fabric of everyday life, something we find hard to imagine today. Now we're surrounded by so much entertainment sport, music, the internet, TV, it's nothing to turn on a screen for instant amusement. In the 18th century, the British were known throughout Europe as keen and accomplished dancers. The country dances they developed became one of the most notable forms of dance of the period. Not only were they extremely sociable, but they had a distinctive way of capturing what was happening in society. Dances and the music were composed to celebrate special events, famous people, plays in the theatre and just about anything that people thought was worthy of celebrating. This becomes apparent when we look at the life of Captain Cook. He was born in Yorkshire in 1728 and his father was a farm labourer who had come from Scotland. Agricultural workers were amongst the poorest of people and when his father married Grace Pace, they lived in a very small thatched cottage in Martin, in Cleveland. It was dim, often damp, and there was no sanitation. James was the second of eight children, and as was common at the time when infant mortality was high, only four of his siblings survived into adulthood. As a farm boy, James was expected to help as soon as he was able. So from about the age of five, he was working with his parents, labouring in the fields. Dancing was a part of this lifestyle, and in the English countryside, people danced at fairs, market days and harvest festivals, as well as in fields, private houses and pubs. There's a tradition of dancing in this area, including social dance, as well as Morris and Clog, which continues to this day. In the 1950s, when people started collecting folk dances in the area, they found a dance called the Black Joke, which was part of the dance tradition in a village not far from where Cook was raised. It had originally been published in the 1730s, which demonstrates the enduring popularity of this type of dance until comparatively recent times. When James was about eight, his father gained a position as the overseer of a large farm and this meant improved circumstances all round, a better home, and for James, more education. Thomas Scaltel, the lord of the manor, recognised that James had more than the average ability, so he paid a penny a week for him to attend the village school. He then helped James into an apprenticeship in the nearby village of Staithes. Mr Sanderson's shop on the waterfront supplied the seafaring community, and James no doubt learnt many useful things which helped him later in his career. However, he wasn't keen on being a shop boy, and had his heart set on going to sea. The story goes that one day a customer came into the shop with a shiny South Sea coin. 
These had been produced by the South Sea Company, which was established in the early 1700s as a trading company, particularly in response to the possibilities opened up by Europeans exploring the Pacific. One of these was William Dampier. He wrote a bestseller about his adventures, and one of his claims to fame was being the first Englishman to set foot in Australia. His travelogue is said to have inspired Daniel Defoe to write Robinson Crusoe, and Jonathan Swift to write Gulliver's Travels. It also inspired a number of dancers, Dampier, the South Seas, Batavia, and the South Sea Ladies. James saw was purported to inspire him to leave the shop in stays and to take to sea. The shop owner supported James and arranged for him to enter into an apprenticeship with the Walker brothers in Whitby. Their main line of trade was transporting coal from Newcastle to London. At the age of 18, Cook started this new position where he was required to learn all aspects of the trade, the sailing of the colliers, as the ships were called, as well as the hard physical tasks of loading and unloading coal. He made regular trips to London, sailing along the east coast of England, and he also sailed into the Baltic and to Ireland. All this was very important training for his future career. In 1755, the year Cook turned 26, he joined the Royal Navy. There is some speculation about his reasons for this. Some historians suggest that he may have joined voluntarily to escape the press gangs who forced or pressed experienced sailors into service in the Navy. To demonstrate how all aspects of life were captured in dance, here's the dance The Press Gang from Fisher's collection of 12 country dances for 1775. For Cook, it seems more likely that he enlisted in a positive career move. The Navy had a certain prestige, more opportunity to travel to foreign places, and it was certainly a cleaner job than working on a collier. In the Navy, dancing on board ship had a long established tradition, particularly on extended voyages. It was one of the ways sailors entertained themselves, and although it was primarily something for the fun of it, there's also an understanding that it was a healthy activity. It was regarded as an antidote to the boredom of shipboard life. People tended not to write about it because it was such a common activity and it's also difficult to describe. We are fortunate to have a letter from the Admiral who was in charge of the North American fleet which Cook joined. Admiral Edward Boscowan wrote to his wife Fanny that every evening as they crossed the Atlantic the sailors would dance to fiddle, fife and drum whenever the weather was calm. Boscowan himself went on to become celebrated in dance after his victory at the Battle of Lagos off the coast of Spain, where he stopped a French fleet from invading England. This was a highly significant event at the time, and the dance Boscowan's Frolic was published in Thompson's 24 Country Dances for the year 1761. It's possible that such a dance entered into the sailors' repertoire Cook arrived in Nova Scotia in 1758 and was based there for four years. The capital was Halifax and it had been established nine years earlier. It was the headquarters of the Royal Navy in North America. 
A dance celebrating Nova Scotia was published in Johnson's A Choice Collection of 200 Favourite Country Dancers in 1751 and again in 1757. Halifax was strategically placed at the opposite end of the island from the French port of Louisbourg. The mission of Admiral Boscowen's fleet was to capture the fort, which they succeeded to do in 1758. This then opened the sea route to Quebec via the St. Lawrence River. The British were very keen to capture Quebec from the French, and Cook played an important role by surveying the river and suggesting good places for the troops to land. They were victorious in 1759. And a few years after this we have the dance A Trip to Quebec in Thompson's complete collection of 200 fashionable country dances, published in London in 1765, perhaps reflecting that now Quebec was a safe place for a holiday, or at least a trip. After a few years away, Cook returned to England, and now secure in his career, wasted no time in marrying Elizabeth Betts. It seems James had met Elizabeth while he'd worked on the colliers. It would take a week to unload and load a collier, and during this time the crew stayed in the taverns near the Port of London. Elizabeth's parents owned a respectable tavern called the Bell Inn in Wapping, a few streets from the river, and it is presumed Cook met Elizabeth when he stayed there. The newlywed couple lived with her parents for a time before moving into a new terraced house in Mile End. This was named for its distance from the centre of London. It was now on the edge of the city, though still surrounded by fields and orchards. As it was within walking distance of the river, it was quickly becoming a respectable area for sea captains and merchants engaged in seafaring. By coincidence, Cook's new home was next door to the Mile End Assembly Rooms. In the 1700s, when dancing was a leading social activity, Assembly Rooms were important venues. They provided places for meetings, concerts and other entertainments, though their prime purpose was for dancing. The Dance Mile End Assembly celebrated this particular gathering. It was first published in 1748, and reprinted four times over the next nine years, with a new version published in 1768 and 1781. We don't know a great deal about Cook's private life, as his wife destroyed all correspondence about their life together shortly before she died, but it seems possible that they would have attended a dance or a concert held in these assembly rooms. The Mile End Assembly Room no longer exists, but there is one in Lancaster which was built at about the same time, which gives an idea of how it may have looked. Nothing remains of Cook's home in Mile End, despite the house being recognised as a significant historical building. It was demolished in 1958 to widen the laneway. Now a plaque on a brick wall designates the site of his family home. The location of the once famous assembly room is still marked by a thoroughfare named Assembly Passage. So far the dances described were coincidental to Cook's life. But now history starts to take a different turn. After years of developing his skills in navigation, astronomy, surveying and cartography, Cook's talents were recognised to such an extent that he was selected to lead a scientific voyage into the Pacific. After this voyage, we begin to see dancers directly connected to him. In 1768, urged by the Royal Society, the British government decided to send an expedition to the newly discovered island of Tahiti to observe the transit of the planet Venus across the face of the Sun. This was the most important scientific mission Britain had ever launched. With advances in mathematics, 
Scientists believe that by observing the transit of Venus from different locations around the world, the distance between the Earth and the Sun could be calculated, and thus the size of the solar system could be defined. When Cook returned from this mission and his journal was published, there was great excitement about his discoveries. And of course, as any important event needed to be celebrated in music and dance, the transit of Venus was published in Bride's collection of dances in 1775. The island where Cook observed the transit was Tahiti. This had been discovered, so to speak, by the explorer Samuel Wallace. He had returned to England just a few weeks before Cook had been due to set sail, and the island was immediately recognised as the perfect location for the observation. Wallace and his crew brought with them tales of the tropical paradise they'd found, where food and fresh water were plentiful and the local people were friendly. The islanders were very generous with the hospitality they extended to the Europeans, in a way that was both surprising and delightful for the sailors who had been without the company of women for several months. Tahiti was seen as an earthly paradise where men and women lived in blissful innocence, far from the corruption of civilization. The dance, The Island of Love, was published in 1775. It's important to note that on Tahiti, Cook issued a list of rules for his men in order to control their behaviour. Defying the colonial zeal of the day, Cook treated the indigenous people he met with a decency uncommon for the time and did his best to instil this attitude in his men. The first of his rules stated, Endeavour by every fair means to cultivate a friendship with the natives and to treat them with all imaginable humanity. Having completed his mission to record the transit of Venus, Cook opened his secret instructions which directed him to search for the mythical great southern continent. It was believed that a very large continent must exist in the southern hemisphere in order to balance the land mass in the north. People had been searching for this for many years, but still vast areas remained uncharted. His first voyage in the endeavour removed some of this speculation, and although he didn't find the enormous continent as expected, the trip was hailed as a success. Some of this was due to the directions supplied to Cook by Lord Morton. James Douglas was the 14th Earl of Morton and the President of the Royal Society. He was a man with enlightened and humanitarian ideas. He compiled a list of hints for Captain Cook, Mr Banks, and the other gentlemen on board the Endeavour, stressing the need to treat the people they encountered on the voyage with consideration. He affirmed that the shedding of blood was a crime of the highest nature, and recommended they exercise the utmost patience and forbearance with respect to the natives, and should check the petulance of the sailors. Noteworthy from a musical point of view was his recommendation that the natives should not at first be alarmed with the report of guns, drums, or even a trumpet. But if there are other instruments of music on board, they should first be entertained near the shore with a soft air. Morton died shortly after the endeavour left England, so he never learned of the outcome of the voyage. The area where I live was named by Cook in his honour, Morton Bay, though a transcription error affected the spelling. The tune, The Earl of Morton's Jig, was published by the famous Scottish fiddler, Neil Gow, in 1792. It's not clear which particular earl it commemorated. However, it does demonstrate the family's interest in the arts. A dance set to the tune was published in Cusack's annual collection of 24 favourite country dances for the year 
1811. Morton would have been aware of the types of music available on ships. Crews commonly included fiddlers, drummers and fifers. Part of their role was to provide music for specific activities and on cook ships they provided entertainment for both the crew and the people they visited along the way. On his first voyage, details about the instruments and musicians are scanty. However, on his second and third voyages, there are considerably more references. The musical instruments included flutes, oboes, French horns and bagpipes, as well as drums and trumpets. Reportedly, the locals in Tahiti loved the bagpipes. Although the published accounts of Cook's travels focus on matters scientific, close reading reveals that music and dance were often used in cultural exchanges and that it generated feelings of friendship. There are many descriptions of the dances performed by the locals for the visiting Europeans, as well as accounts of the islanders loving the English country dances. After each voyage, there was a great deal of public interest in the artefacts Cook brought with him. This illustration shows Joseph Banks, the scientist who accompanied Cook on his first voyage, with some of the treasures he'd acquired. In 1775, the idea of developing an exhibition of these artefacts for the British Museum was put forward. The museum had been established in 1753, so it was still a fairly new institution. The South Seas Room became one of its most popular exhibits and remained so well into the 19th century. Corresponding with this fascination in Cook's discoveries and adventures, the dance South Seas was published in Strait and Skillen's collection of 204 favourite country dances for 1775. Apart from his acclaim as a brilliant navigator and scientist, one of Cook's great achievements was due to the attention he gave to the well-being of his crew. In all the years of his command, he rarely lost a man through preventable disease or accident. He was loved and respected by his men, and many of them never left his command. This is all the more remarkable, considering that at the time, up to half the sailors on a long voyage would not return home. The very high mortality rate among seamen was the main reason the Navy needed to force or press men into service. It wasn't fighting in wars which caused these deaths, it was disease. The conditions and the diet on board ship were so poor that vast numbers of men died from scurvy and dysentery. Because he'd risen through the ranks from the lowliest of positions, Cook had experienced the worst aspects of shipboard life. He'd seen his fellow seamen die from disease. He knew how the men suffered from lack of warm, dry clothing, and he knew how filthy the conditions could be below decks, with no hygiene and no ventilation. He'd resolved to care for his men and implemented a regime of cleanliness and discipline that ensured their good health. He lost very few men through scurvy, because he made certain to obtain fresh food whenever possible. His outstanding success in this regard was recognised with the award of the Royal Society's prestigious Copley Medal. Cook's efforts were greatly appreciated by his crew. Returning from the second voyage, the midshipman Thomas Perry wrote a song in praise of their captain, which included the verse, We were all hearty seamen, no cold did we fear and we have from all sickness entirely kept clear. Thanks be to the captain, he has proved so good, amongst all the islands, to give us fresh food. But another aspect of his care has been almost entirely overlooked. As mentioned earlier, dancing was a regular activity on board ship, but it's notable that Cook actively promoted it. The dance historian Carlo Blasis wrote in the 1820s. Captain Cook wisely thought that dancing was of special use to sailors. 
this famous navigator, wishing to counteract disease on board his vessels as much as possible, took particular care in calm weather to make his sailors and marines dance to the sound of a violin. And it was to this practice that he mainly ascribed the sound health which his crew enjoyed during voyages of several years' continuance. Now we approach the end of Cook's story. Although he did his utmost to establish good relations with the people he visited, due to a succession of unfortunate events, in 1779 he was killed in Hawaii, along with five of his sailors and 17 Hawaiians. News of his death sent shockwaves around the world, and people were devastated that the famous explorer was no more. During his life, he'd been highly praised for his contributions to science, greatly expanding the knowledge of the world. A man who rose from the most humble of beginnings to become one of the greatest navigators in history. In death, he became lauded as a mythical hero. Now stories about his travels began to be portrayed in the theater. The first of these was a pantomime called Oh My, or A Trip Around the World. This was inspired by a visit to England by a young man called Mai. Mai had come from the island of Rayatia near Tahiti. His father had been killed in a tribal war. Mai's family then lost their ancestral lands and escaped to Tahiti. Mai implored Cook to take him to England, hoping he could seek help from King George and regain his lands. Mai spent several years in England and became the darling of society for a time. By all accounts, he was a charming young man and enjoyed the high life of London, meeting the king, being fated by important people, and of course learning how to dance in the English style. Once the novelty wore off, he decided to return home, and he accompanied Cook on his third voyage, and was resettled with as much support as possible from Cook and his crew, including a concert and dancing for the neighbouring islanders. Following his fame and the intense interest in Cook and the Pacific, the pantomime called Oh My was produced in London in 1785. This was a great theatrical spectacle, a mix of farce, mime, song, dance, romance and comedy, presenting the places visited by Cook. It symbolised the union between the South Seas and England in a story which featured Oh My as a prince of Tahiti attempting to reclaim his rightful throne and win the hand of the fair Landina. It included scenes with the islanders dancing, the sailors dancing and the two groups dancing together. The pantomime was a huge success. King George III, who had met Cook, saw it and cried, but still went to every performance. The score, the script and the set designs are still in existence. A distinctive tune from the pantomime called The Ruffians was used for the social dance Oh My, which was published in Campbell's second collection in 1786. of film and television, it was difficult for people to visualize the places and people Cook had visited. The theater played a significant role in providing audiences with a glimpse of this distant and exotic world. In the 18th century, people flocked to the theater. However, the reason Omai was presented as a pantomime was due to the licensing restrictions. Only two theatres in London were licensed to produce serious plays with spoken drama, and this caused other theatres to seek ways to circumvent the licensing laws. This led to the development of new genres, including pantomimes and ballets. In 1788, a grand, serious pantomimic ballet called The Death of Captain Cook was first produced in Paris and the following year in London. The story was loosely based on real events 
and every effort was made to present the scenes and costumes with authenticity. The ballet is set in Hawaii, where Cook assists the king of Hawaii in defeating his invading enemies. The ruler wishes to put the prisoners to death, but Cook is able to save them. Nevertheless, he is attacked and murdered by the antagonists, as they regard him as responsible for their defeat. There were tears and hysterics as audiences witnessed Cook's fatal stabbing. As in the pantomime of Omai, oh the ballet of the death of Cook also included scenes with the sailors dancing. It became immensely popular and toured in Britain and America, with different versions staged throughout Europe. If the concept of portraying Cook's death in ballet seems strange, it's perhaps even more surprising that it was adapted into an equestrian drama. This idea was developed by Philip Astley, the man credited with creating the first circus. His grand equestrian drama of the death of Captain Cook premiered in Dublin in 1789 and subsequently toured in Ireland and England. Others copied his lead and the dance was performed at the Edinburgh Circus in 1790 and taken to America by John Ricketts. In the late 1790s, a lament for Cook was published in a number of Scottish sources and attracted a degree of popular acclaim. Notably, it was used by the poet Robert Burns for the song My Mary, Dear Departed Shade, also known as The Lingering Star. The last 18th century dance to commemorate Cook was published in Corrie and Dussex, 24 new country dances for the year 1797, and entitled simply Captain Cook. Being able to experience the music and the dances associated with Cook brings a completely new understanding to our cultural heritage and creates a special connection to this great man. In recent times, Cook has been identified as the Englishman who brought colonisation to the Pacific. But it's very interesting to read his own thoughts on this. He was very concerned about the effects his discoveries would have on the people he met. He'd already seen how their societies had changed dramatically since his first visit. His contribution to mankind lies in the increased knowledge of our planet and its people, not of its colonisation. When we think of the way the many achievements of James Cook were honoured, we may not immediately think of music and dance. Examining the legacy of Cook through a cultural lens presents different insights into the man and his influence on society. During his life and in the years following his death, music and dance were significant elements in celebrating his memory. Theatrical works were inspired by his voyages and reached many thousands of people throughout Britain and the colonies, Europe and America. Country dances were devised allowing people to commemorate Cook in a cheerful, and socially relevant way. As the 19th century progressed, these works, which had been extremely popular and topical, eventually lapsed into obscurity. In recent times, many events have been held, reenactments staged, and documentaries produced in recognition of Cook, but none seem to have utilized the 18th century music or the dances associated with the captain. To address this situation, I have developed an online resource to provide a cultural biography of Cook's life with recordings, dance instructions, sheet music and detailed information about each tune. To support this research, a CD and a book are available. A teaching unit for primary schools is also available which combines literacy, history, music, song and dance 
visit my website at colonialdance.com.au.